strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hurts and wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having done your weights with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Hey, welcome everyone here this morning. We are truly blessed. If I look around, I see some that are back that have visited with us before. We have some that are here for the very first time to worship with us. We appreciate every one of you choosing to come here and to worship with us today. We look forward to future opportunities to get to know you better, to be able to worship and work together. Now, I have to confess that as I got up here this morning, I felt some disappointment. And I want you to know that we did not intentionally pull a baby slip. And I know in the retail business, when somebody does something to get somebody into a store and then all of a sudden, that particular item or product is not there, that it leads to frustration and even a time to anger. And I just want you to know that the reason that I'm standing up here is my fault. That is, Danny and I talked a couple of months ago, and he had prepared one lesson today. Now, it was so good, I almost asked him to do it twice uh, for the worship hour as well. But uh, Brother DeMoe and his wife, Jim, are on vacation as well as me. With us today, I just didn't have the heart to ask him to speak twice when uh, he had prepared one speech. It is my son. Okay? Did everybody understand who taught it? Say, Jerry. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My father told me, you're off the hook. My, my father told me years ago that there was a certain assumption that a preacher should always make, and that is, Always be prepared. Kind of like the Boy Scout motto. Dad said, I always have a sermon in your Bible. Tucked away in your notebook and you carry with you. Always be prepared. And so, Danny and I had that exchange this morning. I had looked like Jerry in the headlights, but I thought, well, my dad told me this way this time. He, he absolutely did. You know, the price is what we ask for, but we already know the answer, but when do we get it? And so this morning, I got a huge price. So I want to read with you. Some rules of conduct. We engage in a battle. We have a very real enemy. As Christians, we are not alone and we are not just on one side. And even though we know from Scripture that we're on the winning side, amen? We're on the winning side that there is a real engagement that's happening. Seriously, if you look at the passage that Dan read to us. Here in Ephesians 6, spells that out abundantly clear. Um, this is not necessarily a technical list, but it's very practical. And I can't tell you who wrote it. I do not believe that it came directly out of a manual that either the Army, the Marines, the Navy, or the Air Force, the Coast Guard have in one of their books. So here's a list of some rules of combat. But I think have some merit when you realize that they can be applied to us also in the spiritual battleground. Think about this. If the enemy has been raised, so are you. Don't look conspicuous. He's loud and silent. The easy way is 
recognize that deception all around us. In our yard, we've got about 30 trees, about 20 oak trees. So one of the visitors of the natural realm that visits our yard quite often are woodpeckers. How many of y'all know a woodpecker when you hear one? Okay. I mean, you don't have to see it. I mean, I hear it way before I see it, usually. 
and I go looking, and sometimes I have to walk all the way around a tree before I can spot it. We've got those little red-headed woodpeckers, and then we've got the big red pileated, you know, the woody woodpecker type that come in. Woodpeckers use their rat-a-tat-tat. They, they tap on that wood, and you know what they're looking for. Insects. Bugs. They eat the bugs, and I'm thankful they eat the bugs. They just make a mess. Sometimes damage and even can kill a tree in the process. But they're looking for that soft wood. They're looking for those areas of weakness where maybe the insects have already damaged it, but they come along and as they're looking for those little little things, they make a bigger problem. Satan's a deceiver. Because sometimes we'll let the little things slide. There'll be little sins. Paul said, you know We give Satan just a little crack, a little cheek in the armor, and all of a sudden he's deceived us and our lives are completely off course. He's turned us around from the mission and the purpose and the mindset that God wants us to have, and all of a sudden we're flowing along with culture. We're flowing along with the world, and in fact we can absolutely embrace and love all the things that we denounce. About a class today when we had a birthday. When we were born again through Jesus Christ to live a new life, to have a new direction, a new purpose, a new mindset. Satan's a deceiver. His wiles, his deceptions are all around us if we take our eyes off of Jesus. Look with me back in 2 Corinthians in chapter 6, because not only is Satan our enemy and that he's a deceiver, but Satan is also a distractor. Brother Hillard mentioned that at the, the table today as we were thinking about remembering Jesus. And I thought about taking our eyes off Jesus. The way in which he distracts us, again, he uses anything and everything around us because we lose sight of Christ. Satan, one of the ways Satan wants to distract us is he wants us to delay. Look at 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. In the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Your faith and my faith is that God has saved us. And again, Brother Danny used Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in it. God has an intent for us. And Satan wants us to put that off. And he wants to distract us. I'll make a confession this morning. I love sports. I have, I guess, a competitive bone, or maybe 208 competitive bones in my body. I, I love to watch sports. But I read something this past week or so that, that just shocked me. And, and it shouldn't have shocked me. I should have known this. The World Series just ended. Those games lasted, oh, at least two and a half, maybe three hours on television. You know how many minutes of action there actually is in a three-hour baseball game? About 18, maybe in a good game, 20 minutes of action. Three hours. We sit there in front of that screen, all right? Football game. I love to watch football. It's three, three and a half hours. You know how many actual minutes of action? About 11 to 12 minutes of action. So next time your wife says, are you going to waste three hours? She's meaning it. All right? Not because the action's the waste, but because there's a lot of filler there in between. Satan wants as much filler in our lives. He wants to take our eyes off Jesus and off the fact that the world is lost and off the fact that you... If you've not made a decision to be a Christian, oh, you're distracted. I, I wish I could say, like, like that Mr. Hand Grenade, when the pen is pulled, he's not our friend. I, I wish I could tell you that time was your friend, but it isn't. Because time is uncertain. In our lives, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. And he could come today. And I know that it's a beautiful fall day outside, and you probably want to get out and enjoy it. But I will tell you this, if you enjoy a beautiful sunny day at the expense 
of eternity? That's not a good trade. That's not a good trade. The decision that you make to follow, to love God, to let God remove your sins and place you in a relationship to where you can have the promise, the hope of a home in heaven, oh, there is nothing that should distract you from that decision. Nothing that should cause you to delay that choice. Jesus, on the road there in Matthew 16, 21 to 23, he warned his disciples that he was going to Jerusalem and he was going to be bound there and, and he was going to suffer many things and he was going to be killed. Remember what Peter said? Oh, oh, no, no, no. Jesus listened to Satan as Peter spoke. Jesus knew that Satan was behind the motive of Peter saying these things. No, this was the purpose of God. This had been in the mind of God before the foundation of creation. It had to be fulfilled. We needed a Savior. Jesus was going to fulfill and finish that mission. And so he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but you are mindful of the things of men. What are we mindful of? Satan's distracted us. We're not mindful of the things that God wants us to be mindful. I want you to look in there in 2 Corinthians, but turn to chapter 10. And notice that it's not just that Satan is a deceiver. He's not just a distractor trying to delay us, but he is also wanting our disobedience. In 2 Corinthians 10, beginning of verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You know what Satan wants? He wants us to disobey God. He wants us to be so deceived, so distracted, that we delay for our salvation and we disobey God. Look at what Paul says here. We're able to bring down problems. We're able to bring logic and reason back because God has revealed it to us. He hasn't kept this a secret and said, well, I can tell you what's going to happen later. He told us we're going to stand in the day of judgment. We're going to look at him. And we're going to say, we said no to Jesus. We said no to your command to obey him, to repent, to put our trust in him so that we would do what he said, make that big succession. To be baptized and ignore him. But it's a good thing. God is a human being. To refuse to do what God says, that's disobedience. Can I make that a good point? Let me go out there and spell that out in your basic words. Understand that the basis for that, and then living out of it, we hold on to what every sin and every promise and every blessing that God gives us to be overcome. Listening, that disobedience is something that Satan is working to try to bring down. What an interesting story. Kind of amusing. This is recently about in central China. There was a zoo. And the zookeeper had a dilemma. The lion uh, had, had died. And the need to replace the lion in the exhibit did not have quick access to a lion. Wanted the zoo to be open. That was a lot of income that they would lose if they closed. So he came up with an idea. He put a very large animal in the cage, the lion den. It was a Tibetan mastiff. It's a large dog. And it's furry, it's very hairy, it's very large. And he thought, well, from a distance, people won't really be able to tell. But that one thing, you know what dogs do when they're so motivated to make a sound? They bite. You know what lions don't do when they make a sound? They don't bark. The Tibetan mastiff barked, and all the people were asking for refunds. And the officials, the government officials, made a close the zoo because obviously this was a great big uh, destruction, a great big uh, loss that had been perpetrated by those who were victims. And so Satan used any disguise possible. And unless you identify him as the deceiver and as your enemy, we can miss. That's right. We've got to come to our senses, call yourself innocent. 2 Timothy 2.26, so that we can escape the same set back. All of us. If you look here at Ephesians 6, the armor of the victim, God supplies our defense, our armor, 
stuff and how we can always stay connected to Him. I want you to look at this armor. And I don't want to get into all the details of these particular pieces of the armor, but I want to tell you what they're connected to. Paul is looking at a Roman soldier. He's under guard. He's writing the letter of Ephesians while he's in prison in Rome. The end of Acts 28 is a study. But look at these pieces of armor. And Paul looks at the Roman soldier. He says, there in verse 14, that you have girded with your waist with truth. That you put on the breastplate of righteousness. That you've got your feet down with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Taking the shield of faith. And taking the helmet of salvation. Whether it is truth, whether it is righteousness, whether it is peace, whether it is faith, whether it is salvation. Do you recognize something? Every one of those originates with God. Those are the very things that we have lost because of our willful disobedience, our sin. Only God can supply these things. Therefore, only God can protect us. Only God can defend us. Only God can keep us to where our victory is assured in Christ. If God is for us, who can be against us? If this armor is in our relationship with God, and if we allow to be seen, He will remove our armor. He will remove the truth, the righteousness, the peace, the faith, the salvation. We've got to not only defend, we've got to be able to have the offer. Look at verse 17. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Lord's God. What I want to tell you is that the sword is something you ought to be familiar with. I would guarantee you that you would not want to go into battle if you had never held a sword. You want to be, you want to be experienced. You want to be able to use that in some sort of a nimble way that is effective. A sword is not something that you want to be inexperienced and say, well, I don't know how it works. A sword is something you want to fight. When it comes to the Bible, we're to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts, and we're to always be ready to give an answer or a reason for the hope that is in us. His meekness and fear, 1 Timothy 3.15. Knowing the Word of God. If I could tell you what I see in our culture and in our world today, is it, yes, the culture is becoming more atheistic or agnostic at least. The culture is moving more in a pagan and very very sinful way. We see sin that is absolutely just put in front of us that we, we, we can't turn our eyes, close our eyes away from it. And stop the racism in our society for sin. But one of the things that many, and even sadder than the way this culture and society is moving away from God, is the fact that even Christians are silent. We need to be able to defend. We need to be able to promote. And I don't mean to be ugly. I'm not talking about being offensive. I'm not talking about using ways and means that are, are not going to be effective in helping people to open their minds and to see the truth. But the one thing we cannot do is to be silent. We've got to be ready to speak. If we believe something that, that has reasons for our faith, we should not come blind leaps into the dark. Get not a hand off of the car when we believe in God. Bible is the Word of God. We need to know the sword of the Spirit. I, I, I know some of you may say, well, I, I'm just starting to study and read the Word. Then, then may God bless you and, and may we encourage and help you to understand it, to learn to discern, to exercise your senses, to know good and evil, so that you can use it and you have that experience of not just milk, but fire. So you understand how these principles and the concepts and scriptures fit together. With that in mind, that's why we come back together on Sunday night. We have our open Bible study. And our Bible class is on Wednesday night. And our Bible class is on Sunday morning. And we have Bible classes at other times if you need to. If you want to. There are those in this congregation that would be glad to be with you one on one to help you to continue to grow in your faith. Read the Word of God. Notice what he says there. Read the Word of God. Verse 18. Pray always with our prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Be watchful to the end, to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We need to pray. We need to pray always. We need to pray for the last. We need to pray for the saints. We have many need to have a relationship with God. Just recently, a 
December 25th, 2013. From Lawrence Bird, Tennessee. And I, I've known a few people from Lawrence Bird back in the year, a few of those that were very, very dear to me. In Lawrence Bird, Tennessee, there was an apartment complex. An elderly woman downstairs fell asleep. She had a cigarette and caught fire with her bed, and the apartment complex was engulfed in flames. There was an eight year old boy, Jonathan Bent, who went door to door in that complex yelling, Fire! Get out! Run! God bless Jonathan Bent, who saved many people that, that night by warning them, by crying out and telling them something that was real, a real danger. Get into the relationship with God through Jesus Christ that can save your soul. There's a warning. Every single one of us who are Christians has a responsibility to share it. The Lord will find a way to me. The Lord will find a way to you to open up your life to let him have a day. You need to become a child of God. You need to become a child for those who come in to be baptized today, if you are a Christian, you realize in your life that you've kind of let these things go, you, you let Satan distract you, deceive you, cause you to be murdered, so that you may be used with you and your obedience. Come back to make a new commitment today. We want to encourage you to do some stuff in